you to computer science. Welcome. And another in our series of ISTS speakers on Russian hacking, OMG. So we're trying to tear things from the headlines here. Uh, so today we're happy to have Ben Miller, uh, Director of Threat Operations at Dragos, talking about issues in industrial control systems in the power grid. Um, and uh, he is over about two decades of experience in real world industrial security stuff. Uh, before Dragos, he was at uh, Associate Director for the Electricity ISAC, so had another you know, multi, multi vendor point of view on things. Um, and he's going to tell us a lot of exciting things. So, that big time. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I uh, am Ben Miller. I work at Dragos. Uh, Dragos is a, a security startup uh, uh, that uh, was founded by Rob Lee. Uh, who uh, is uh, fairly well known in the space from industrial control system security. He's an, a SANS instructor uh, and, and has, uh, we've begun focusing our energy on industrial control systems specifically uh, and uh, not to, to sales pitch Dragos, but to overview what Dragos does and then some of my background so you understand some of the biases I'm, I'm bringing to this talk. Um, we're focused entirely on industrial control systems. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, what that is, I will be uh, defining that at, at a high level, introducing it, and then uh, going into some more detail there. Um, and, and we're primarily focused on creating a uh, mechanism for defense in, in control systems environments. Uh, right now, there's a lot of discussion on patching and architecting, uh, uh, but not a lot on sustained defense. So, so what happens when an adversary does get in the network? Can you detect it? Do you have visibility into that? And do you have uh, the expertise to, to actually defend it. Uh, so we're bringing a platform to market that does that. Uh, uh, target industries are electricity sector, uh, oil, uh, treatment facilities, uh, petrochemical plants, any, any sort of manufacturing uh, 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 lines or factories, uh, 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 things along those lines. Uh, my team itself, uh, I lead the uh, uh, Threat Operations Center, which is kind of the, the professional service uh, services arm of Dragos where we uh, are kind of threat centric and we do proactive threat compromise assessments looking for adversaries in these environments doing baselining of their environments uh, and then performing its response uh, 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 actions if that's required in, in these industrial environments. A very niche of a niche of a niche uh, is ultimately what it comes down to. Uh, prior to joining Dragos, I was at uh, NERC which is, stands for North American Electric Reliability uh, uh, Corporation. Uh, and they're, they're actually a non-federal agency that has regulatory oversight over the North American uh, power grid, well, the, the American power grid, uh, but oversight throughout North America uh, as well, including Canada and parts of Mexico. Um, and is a, a very unusual construct, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, prior to that, I was at Constellation Energy, and I built out their uh, security monitoring and incident response practice. Um, so, uh, uh, when I was talking to Sergey uh, on what he'd like to present, it, uh, he, he really asked for a, a inform, uh, informing uh, the general audience on what ICS is and, and what, it, uh, what it can do and what the implications are, and then get into some of the nitty gritty uh, for those who are more interested in that. Uh, so, industrial control systems. Uh, starting in 2002, a uh, former contractor in Australia who is angry at the, the former part uh, of his, his description uh, was upset and, and did a series of attacks against the, the sewage treatment facility that he was operating on. Uh, he uh, was uh, later discovered in his car outside the facility with a bunch of uh, RF equipment and, and caused multiple sewage spills over several days uh, into a, a marshland that was actually a, a, a preservation land uh, by, the, by the government. Uh, I believe he spent some time in prison for that. Uh, in 2009, there were a set of uh, centrifuges that were enriching uh, uranium in Iran. They had problems sustaining operations, uh, multiple failures, uh, and, and uh, uh, successive just uh, setbacks in their uranium enrichment program that ended up uh, being caused by uh, what is uh, purported to be a attack by Israeli and US based uh, forces uh, uh, dubbed Stuxnet, also dubbed Olympic Games. In 2002 or in 2012, a secure, a industrial security event 
I'm sorry, industrial control system vendor uh, called uh, Telvent, uh, focused on a, a software product line called Oasis Software. Oasis Software was uh, is uh, software used uh, primarily in oil and, and gas pipelines uh, and used to, to maintain those systems. Uh, Telvent itself experienced a breach in 2012 by Chinese actors that exfiltrated uh, large sums of data, including uh, what's publicly uh, referenced as project files. Uh, these project files would be, say, uh, schematics that would help a particular pipeline uh, run and be maintained, uh, and those uh, made their way uh, to the Asia Pacific. In 2014, a, a German steel mill uh, was in operation, and they lost control of their process and could not shut down their furnace. Uh, this caused uh, a large-scale outage and a potential uh, impact to human life. No one was injured. Uh, uh, and in 2015, as well as 2016, uh, there were uh, blackouts in Ukraine. Uh, the 2015 uh, blackout was a, a, a blackout sustained across multiple regions in Ukraine for approximately six to eight hours. Uh, and this was at the distribution level, which is kind of uh, at a neighborhood level. And then in 2016, a, uh, a similar attack at transmission level uh, substation was basically just turned off, uh, which caused uh, uh, a um, widespread outage across northern parts of uh, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. So what do all these things have to do with each other? Um, I'll start with some context, and, and then uh, we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of uh, control systems, and then we'll talk a little bit about the electric grid, since that's more of my background from a, an example set. I think everyone's familiar with technology. Uh, they think of ARPANET, they think of uh, Google and Facebook and everything uh, that, that's uh, in your pocket as far as your phone. Uh, these are well-known concepts that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Another uh, thread uh, interwoven there that isn't as commonly recognized or known is uh, control systems and the con uh, how control systems have grown and, and uh, kept pace, not as fast of a pace, but pace uh, with the technological trends uh, that we're familiar with on the internet. Uh, so in, uh, control systems uh, really are creating feedback loops and, and measuring real world aspects. Um, I think I have a formal definition on the next couple of slides. Um, uh, but they began, began to become digital in uh, the 1960s. Uh, the, the first uh, digital uh, uh, programmable logic controller, PLC, uh, which I'll get into some of the nitty gritty on that, was developed, um, uh, was Modicon, uh, developed in, I think, 1969. Uh, and then a series of progressions allowed the maturation of control systems into, from the analog world in, into the digital world. Uh, this progressed in, uh, remote capture, uh, remote sensing, remote operation in the, the protocol called Modbus, Modbus uh, in the uh, um, early 70s. Uh, Modbus was designed to run all over serial connections uh, uh, and uh, eventually evolved into something else uh, uh, that will uh, into TCP IP days. Uh, digital relays, protective relays, were developed in the uh, 86. Uh, by Edward Schweitzer of uh, Schweitzer Electric Labs. Uh, digital uh, protective relays are, you can think of as um, uh, kind of uh, breaker systems uh, on distribution and transmission uh, uh, grid operations in order to isolate uh, um, uh, surges or, or other uh, types of activity into a small region uh, rather than a large geographic uh, uh, region. Added onto that is the progression of the grid itself. Uh, starting in the early 19th century was uh, Pearl Street Station, uh, which was the uh, first uh, power plant in operation uh, in, in the US. Uh, that was located in, pop quiz, anyone? <laughs> That's the street. <laughs> uh, New York City uh, by the famous Edison. Uh, uh, stood up Pearl Street as a demonstration of the light bulb and, and how uh, that uh, would eventually become a world changer. I, I think uh, within a year or two, he had um, 
It's something in the order of magnitude of uh, 500 lights that were being powered by, by Pearl, uh, Pearl Street Station. Uh, certainly a humble beginning to what turned into a, a uh, continent-wide uh, uh, grid system. Uh, the, the kind of the use case uh, the, and the battle between Edison and Tesla uh, was between direct current and alternating current. Uh, alternating current allowed generation facilities to be um, somewhere other than in your backyard. So you didn't have the coal and the dust and, and the suit and all of that. Um, so uh, AC is really uh, what allows for the uh, transmission, which are the, the uh, long stretches of um, high tension wire that you would see um, not on, on a telephone pole, but the, the big uh, uh, steel structures uh, that uh, are really coming from uh, a, um, a generation plant of some sort. Uh, nuclear power plant, uh, nuclear uh, uh, became a thing in the uh, uh, 19, I think late 40, 1940s. Uh, shipping port was the first nuclear power plant in the US. Um, uh, the relays I mentioned, uh, Schweitzer as being the first digital relay, they started as electromechanical uh, devices that would actually uh, uh, sense what was going on in the wire and make a physical movement to basically open up the, the, uh, the breaker. Um, uh, prone to failure, uh, slow response times, those were eventually turned into uh, uh, an analog component called solid state relays uh, in the, um, I think, um, uh, mid 50s. Those were uh, soon outpaced by the, the SEL equipment, the digital uh, frame relays that I, I mentioned earlier, or digital protective relays I mentioned earlier. Um, to AMI, uh, which is uh, advanced metering infrastructure. Uh, so when I was a kid, uh, my dog would uh, go crazy every time a uh, meter man walked by the house to, to uh, go up to the foundation and see the, the usage on our electric meter. Um, somewhere along the lines that stopped uh, and it turned into a uh, guy walk, or using a uh, truck and just going down the neighborhood. Uh, that was uh, AMR, uh, so that uh, meter had a little uh, RF and just uh, uh, sent out the signal of what the meter was so that the meter uh, person didn't have to go directly to each house. He could just drive by the neighborhood. That evolved into AMI, uh, which is uh, Advanced Meter Infrastructure, also known as Smart Grid. Uh, so if you have a smart meter on the side of your house, uh, that's the latest and greatest uh, uh, in kind of where we stand today. Uh, and then looking towards the future, we have the Industrial Internet of Things, uh, which doesn't really have a definition, uh, but as, as my boss put it after uh, taking a tour at, I think it was an avionics facility, I don't know what IoT is, but they got it. <laughs> um, so uh, something up and coming and, and a huge uh, shift in, in thought and in, in, uh, complexity from, from a scale perspective. Um, but let's talk about industrial control systems and, and uh, what they are, uh, does everyone, a show of fans of who's really familiar with uh, industrial control systems? Uh, and the rest are like, this is like new slate. I'm hoping for a new slate. Uh, so industrial control systems, as I said, are really uh, uh, taking uh, four core functions, measuring, comparing values, computing values, and, and correcting a process. They're really designed for uh, what's now uh, commonly referred to as an industrial process, wherever that industrial process is. So that could be uh, uh, cleaning water at a water treatment facility. It could be sustaining grid operations for the electric grid. It could be uh, creating uh, a car uh, with a bunch of robots on, on a manufacturing line or um, uh, filling beer cans. Uh, and they do that through a, a variety of mechanisms. Uh, uh, sensors, uh, transducers, transmitters, controllers. Um, I find that to be a very kind of high level kind of academic uh, definition of what control systems is. And uh, for me, uh, uh, trying to understand this, th these sorts of definitions didn't help me because I want to touch and, and feel things. So we're going to keep diving into what PLCs are and what industrial control systems are. Um, I mentioned Modicon. This was the first PLC. Um, the size of, of a small fridge. Uh, and and that, so that was the first digital uh, programmable uh, uh, logic controller. The, the programmable logic controller is really 
designed to take input, do some sort of logic on it, that's the L part, and, and then output a, a response as well. And it's a really simple, like uh, one, computers 101, uh, it's distilled down to input output uh, in that regard. And um, uh, Modicon was the very first one. Uh, so um, very similar to any sort of computer, computer processor, uh, you have things like uh, registers, you have uh, Boolean values that are, are read to, uh, 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 written from, uh, written to, etc. Um, a, a lot of the same concepts that we're familiar with in the IT realm uh, just have a different name in, in the ICS realm. Uh, but ultimately, you have input, you have output, and you have uh, you can directly read and write registers as well as Boolean. So a register value, for instance, might be um, the um, the, the depth or, or the uh, the amount of water in a tank, for instance, the, the volume of water in a tank might be set at 50 uh, in that um, it has some sort of semblance within the industrial process and what 50 means and the engineer understands that. Uh, or uh, maybe uh, a valve is open or closed, that's a, a coil uh, one or zero, uh, very straightforward. But what does it mean? Uh, so this is a PLC. Uh, this is an Allen Bradley. Uh, each, uh, each of these are uh, separate modules uh, that are basically uh, components that can be plugged into to the, the, um, the frame and have uh, various capabilities. Some of them may be, uh, have different inputs or outputs, uh, uh, but they're ultimately um, as simple as uh, feeding inputs directly from a sensor or actuator of some sort, and then uh, also uh, lines uh, serially connected to uh, the devices that they, they control. Maybe a motor, um, in the case of a centrifuge that's spinning around at a certain RPM, uh, or a protective relay, or, or a tap changer on, on a, a um, transformer. So uh, serial devices uh, are connected through those electronic, electronically uh, but what you'll um, see is that there's also an Ethernet jack uh, plugged into the one module. Uh, so the field devices themselves may be uh, kind of discrete devices communicating to that one module, uh, but that's uh, then being uh, fed to another PLC or a, a master unit of some type uh, and eventually uh, fulfilling the rest of the, the process that's needed. So maybe this is uh, one of several PLCs inside a substation. Uh, and those in aggregate form are being sent to a, a, a control center uh, that is being used by a system operator to maintain the balance of the grid uh, from a, a, a demand response perspective. So I, I mentioned coils uh, and, and, and registrars, uh, registers, um, but I, I actually have an example of what that data looks like uh, from uh, the network side of the house. Let me see if I can switch windows here. Where's my mouse? Okay. Uh, so Wireshark uh, is, is uh, everyone familiar with Wireshark? Uh, so uh, Wireshark is an application that can listen to network traffic off the wire. So you can I'll, I'll plug a, your laptop into a, a special port on a network switch, and it'll see all the traffic that's being generated and, and moving across that switch. Uh, and so my team actually, uh, a, as a uh, service to some of our customers, will go on site, uh, we'll take a, a sample network traffic, and then we'll analyze it, look for anomalies, look for bad guys, um, uh, that sort of thing. This uh, is actually uh, customer data that's uh, been redacted to, to characterize uh, what would be seen in a water treatment facility. Uh, so a water treatment facility uh, is um, like the, the background PLC there uh, that is uh, doing various measurements, uh, uh, treating water, uh, and then uh, communicating in a very, very basic fashion using Modbus. So I mentioned Modbus earlier. Modbus is um, a serial link uh, that's tied from or, or has history uh, in 
serial links uh, similar to that from the, the PLC out to the, the field devices, where it's basically talking uh, um, um, uh, down one wire in, in a binary fashion, in, in a very repeatable fashion, and that's called Modbus, the, the actual um, architecture there. That's been mapped over to TCP IP. Uh, so when they were trying to figure out how, how to get more interoperability and communications, uh, they had this thing called Ethernet and this thing called TCP IP back in the 90s, and they'll say, all right, we'll, we'll just encapsulate the serial protocol over TCP IP. And thus you have a Modbus TCP IP. Um, that may be a bit difficult to read, uh, uh, but what we have is uh, uh, two machines, actually we have several machines uh, uh, talking, one of them, uh, 172.31.1 is a uh, master uh, device that is querying another uh, PLC, uh, 172.31.1.3 that's highlighted there. And it is um, very basic, it is giving a function uh, one, which is a read coil. And then the client responds with a, a response back with the, the, the Boolean of that coil, zero or one. Um, in this case, the, uh, I can't do it from here. It, uh, the, the case I had highlighted, the, the response was uh, zero. And then you can also see uh, a query for uh, scan of the registers. Uh, and then the response back. and the the response. Yeah. Uh, so you have a register uh, 1088, uh, and the value for that register is uh, 5998. Uh, so imagine yourself as an attacker. Um, what's wrong with this? <laughs> this protocol. Um, they're they're was no authentication, there's no encryption, uh, there's no identification, uh, no authorization, nothing. But that command, um, or actually I can find a write command that will change that value. Again, no authentication, no encryption, uh, uh, no validation of any kind, no, no, there's, there's not even a checksum. Um, and, and so this is from a, lo a lot of the uh, kind of rhetoric in, in, in the press and others, these systems are completely insecure. Uh, you, can, uh, you can give a, a device to a hacker, he's going to find a vulnerability and it's going to crash the box uh, in a matter of an hour, a couple hours, whatever. They're right. But what does 5998 mean? How does changing that do anything to the power plant? or to the water treatment plant. It might do something. <laughs> it might not. Uh, uh, and, and that comes to, to the nuance of industrial control systems. So yeah, you can kick over one box, but that is part. Uh, that is uh, one little machine in, in a, a much larger uh, environment that's doing a lot of things. And that environment's actually engineered uh, with the physical process in mind. Uh, uh, which I'll get into on some of the, the safety systems. Uh, let me flip back. Uh, so a, a classic implementation of an industrial control system, uh, a, a um, kind of a reference model of what it should look like uh, is something called the Purdue model. Um, Purdue as in the university, not Purdue as in the chicken. Um, and it uh, has several levels. Level zero uh, being the actual field devices. These are actuators, motors, uh, sensors, uh, uh, gauges, things along these lines. These, uh, these are connected to uh, control devices such as the PLCs. Uh, RTUs, which stands for real-time unit, is uh, more or less a variation or, or a very uh, specific task, uh, specific oriented uh, PLC, but it's, it's doing the same functionality or, or it's acting as an aggregator for multiple PLCs, uh, as well as protective relays and, and things along these lines. This is where IP connectivity uh, starts to happen, where the PLCs and RTUs are now talking IP, uh, uh, TCP IP, and, and feeding up the stack to level two, 
which uh, would be more of the supervisory uh, control aspect. So your human machine interface, uh, HMI, uh, which is um, SCADA for uh, a Windows box with some special software on it, <laughs> uh, as well as historians, uh, which is a SCADA for an SQL database uh, that's storing uh, activity of uh, the, the process over time. Uh, so uh, Valve has been open and shut this many times over the course of whatever, um, or, or uh, um, uh, deviations from a vibration control monitor suggests that a maintenance uh, cycle is required to make these sorts of corrections. It, it's more of the long view uh, for maintenance uh, and diagnostic purposes. Uh, and then engineering workstations. So the engineers that are actually controlling the process of the pH balance or, or um, uh, the protective relay scheme, things along these lines. They're the ones who are creating the logic that gets stored into these PLCs. Uh, so, and they're doing that logic creation, that program creation uh, on these engineering workstations and then pushing them down uh, to, the, to the various uh, logic devices as needed. Uh, next level up uh, is uh, notionally a very similar, more auxiliary systems. Um, I, I was um, uh, talking earlier with one of the students on, um, uh, say, your local utility. Uh, when there's an outage, uh, you log into their website and, and you see where the outage is. Uh, that wasn't some guy putting a pinprick on, on the map. That's automatic uh, outage management system uh, that's very much tied to the energy management system uh, in all the servers and HMI infrastructure. And that's really done at the layer three, layer two uh, levels, uh, depending on how you slice and dice it. Uh, and then ideally, you have a, a level one point, or 3.5, uh, which is focused on uh, security controls and, and creating that uh, deviation between the rest of the networks. Uh, so you will have remote access is granted from this environment and from the corporate environment um, into the DMZ and then into the other systems. You'll have your antivirus servers, your patch management servers, your if you have Active Directory uh, things, uh, infrastructure that uh, you're fair, would be very familiar with if you're you're used to working in a, a classic data center operation. And then le level four is the rest of the plant. Uh, so whether it's a, a um, generation plant, uh, a nuclear facility, a, a manufacturing floor. Somebody has to get email. Uh, somebody has to process <laughs> and, and look at documents and whatnot. All of those workstations, all of those servers that you would uh, expect to be in, in a more classic uh, office environment are that plant network, which may or may not, may not be tied into the rest of the enterprise uh, if they're uh, part of a, a larger organization uh, or directly connected to the internet. Uh, so what does this look like in the real world? Uh, uh, that uh, water treatment facility, where I had that uh, um, uh, other app open that showed some of the data there, I was given a, a five minute sample of their network traffic uh, from one switch and say, make sense of this uh, without any, any knowledge uh, of their network. And I can talk a lot about their network, but at a high level, I, it kind of relates to it. So they, they had uh, two, two different uh, uh, control zones. Uh, they were each running a different process. One of them was speaking um, um, Ethernet IP uh, which is actually a industrial control protocol, not the classic Ethernet and uh, internet protocol that you're used to. Again, different terms, uh, slightly different nuances. And then the other control zone was um, uh, speaking Modbus, and that had, I think, 13, 13 devices communicating on that. Uh, and again, that goes back to a, a cyber view of this industrial process. I don't particularly know and, and can't infer what that process is based on that network traffic. I can tell that how many devices are communicating, uh, maybe, maybe infer on some of the field devices that are attached to those control devices, but I can't tell that that is uh, the water storage tank and that's the, the water treatment tank. Uh, I can't, I can't uh, infer that from, from this traffic, uh, but I can't infer a lot from the supervisory zone, so I was able to uh, identify the, the application servers that they use for their water treatment, and that includes the, the human machine interface uh, and, and all the, the applications behind that, which is a, a GE product. Um, uh, I found some miscommunications in that environment uh, and, and some 
uh, oddities as far as um, uh, packet loss and other things that I recorded and sent back to them. And then they had a DMZ zone, uh, which presumably is tied back to their corporate network, that had SQL servers uh, and their historian uh, data uh, being mirrored into that environment. But that doesn't get me into how do I attack a process and do something really neat. Like, uh, do I change that register value from 3998 or whatever it was to zero? And does that cause a really bad day for someone? Or, or is it even going to get noticed? Uh, and a lot of that uh, comes to safety systems in actual physical engineering. Uh, so so there, there's really two different kinds of, of safety systems. One of them is another PLC that's monitoring the first PLC uh, that's just there to, to trigger in an outlier event that should have never happened. So if, if the, um, the measurement PLC is reading 3995 and it's never supposed to go above 3000, then that uh, uh, safety system, uh, which is just a active uh, PLC, will take an action on that. Uh, that would be an active uh, uh, safety system. A passive sa safety system would be if that uh, 3998 was actually uh, potentially causing a um, overpressurization event, for instance, uh, there's a pipe that is can only withstand a certain amount of pressure and then it intentionally bursts and it lets that pressure out in a safe fashion uh, that goes to a reservoir of some kind and it was engineered for that. Um, that's again something that isn't really covered in the media, right? Because it's not very sexy. They attack the PLC. Yeah, and the system did exactly what it was supposed to do. Exactly how it was engineered, thanks. Uh, um, but some of the nuances uh, that get missed a lot. Uh, so uh, to, to focus in on, on control systems and kind of summarize, uh, yeah, you can hack these devices. If you have access to them, uh, it, it's uh, um, really easy. Uh, it, if, if you want to make a, a specific outcome uh, happen, such as I want to destroy their, uh, the uranium that they're trying to produce uh, and, and at the same time destroy the motors and the centrifuges that they're using it to do it with, and I don't want anyone to know for months and years on end, that's more than just a hack. <laughs> uh, uh, that is a sustained operation that is understanding the, the physics of, of the centrifuges uh, and, and the actual enrichment process and determining what it takes to get you there and then uh, uh, writing code to actually do that in not just uh, one device, but in uh, literally hundreds of devices uh, at the same time without, again, uh, uh, letting off the, the, letting the cat out of the bag that it's actually software driven, not uh, hardware or, or operator driven. Uh, which leads us to critical infrastructures. Uh, so there are several critical infrastructures. Uh, mine is the electric sector. Uh, that's what I have experience with. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk on some of the dynamics on electric sector. Um, and then we can uh, um, talk about kind of current state and, and, and um, where things are and, and give some more examples. So the North American electric bulk uh, power system uh, uh, is uh, really has a, a lot of delineations and a lot of different ways to look at the bulk electric grid. Uh, if you ask any uh, electrical engineer what the uh, largest machine in the world is, his response will be the North American power grid. Uh, what's neat about electricity is uh, the power that's being generated here was, for all, um, for all intents and purposes, was generated at the same time that it's shining through that light bulb. Uh, so that there's a constant load and, and uh, uh, balance between the plant and, and the usage, the demand uh, out there. Uh, and that causes um, everything to stay in sync. So the, the generator uh, that's producing electricity in Alabama is uh, running exactly in phase with the generator wherever your, your closest generator is. They're all in sync. Uh, due to the alternating uh, uh, AC, alternating current, and, and the phases associated with that. More on that later. Um, ultimately, you have generation, transmission, and, and uh, uh, distribution. 
I kind of define the transmission aspect of the, the large towers that are moving load from the, the power plants uh, into the communities. Uh, those are stepped down using transformers inside of uh, uh, transmission substations into uh, 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 DC and, and lower, lower uh, uh, power strengths into uh, customers, whether they are um, a, your house or a college facility or a manufacturing floor or something that requires more emph. The technology behind that is completely scattershot. Uh, so the electric grid has been around since technically or 1890s uh, with the Pearl Street uh, power plant. Uh, and it is a mishmash of everything that uh, you could possibly think of. Uh, the no, uh, modern technology, you have uh, wireless AMI I talked about, you have uh, microgrids, uh, wind, uh, the variable uh, generation such as wind and solar and, and the aspects and management of that. You have uh, phaser measurement units, which are really diagnostic equipment at, at transmission levels so that if there uh, are deviations in um, in, in uh, transmission over long distances that can be measured, altered, uh, changed over time. Uh, and, and those those meetings and the changes of uh, uh, the, the meters has really uh, drastically in, evolved in the last um, probably 10 years. Uh, so uh, a classic meter was taking a reading like, uh, I'm not sure the frequency, uh, maybe once an hour. Uh, your smart meter is taking a reading uh, a couple times a second. Um, so, so the volume of data has increased drastically uh, in the utilities using that uh, for uh, um, things such as uh, 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 further baselining activity, uh, being able to project out uh, activity uh, during peak times and non-peak times and on the pricing structure uh, in the market uh, changes based on that as well. Uh, you have energy management systems, distribution management systems, outage management systems, GIS, uh, geospatial information systems, uh, et cetera. All of these are um, small components in, in an overall uh, grid. A, a good uh, explanation of uh, what an actual transmission company looks like from wire. Uh, so one of our other customers listening on their, their traffic, uh, this is a map uh, of what they have. And so they have uh, the core of their operation, which is their energy management system. Uh, so this is doing, uh, this is, if you imagine a, a extremely large display in like a control center operation that has the line chart of, of all the substations and the lines that are either energized or de-energized and you have uh, system operators uh, uh, doing dispatch and control uh, based on that and balancing the load. Uh, that's happening at the EMS level. Uh, their communication to substations to say open a breaker, close a breaker is being done through IP. They go through this firewall uh, and then down into, uh, they have uh, fiber optic run between all their subs. Uh, they happen to have right of way uh, across all their transmission lines so they can deploy fiber everywhere um, into their substations, which is again, uh, industrial switches, PLCs and, and field devices out there managing everything from um, uh, lightning poles uh, uh, to capture lightning and direct it into the ground instead of into their, their uh, uh, transformer, uh, transformer uh, uh, transformers themselves, uh, uh, breakers and feeders and, and all of these devices are at the substation level, their IP connectivity in there. Um, you have a test EMS, which is really just a test dev environment for staging for uh, patches and, and uh, changes along those lines. You have a high security domain and then you have your corporate network, the corporate network itself connected to the internet. Um, in this chart, it looks like a corporate can get to the EMS, can get to the substation, uh, but that's not how they have their access controlled. Uh, the corporate basically can get to the uh, high security domain uh, and uh, that's about it. Uh, the high security domain is that a uh, level 3.5 that I mentioned before in the Purdue model that you had your AV and your jump hosts and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so as a typical user uh, who would say be at their house and they, he's an engineer, he needs to get to a substation. 
what he would need to do is uh, VPN into his uh, into the corporate uh, VPN. So he uses his normal username and password that he would normally use. He uses a dual factor authentication, logs in, uh, and is on the corporate network. He then VPNs into the high security domain, uses a second set of credentials uh, that is more stringent on the password complexity so they can't have the same password. Uh, and then is also dual factor authentication. From there, he has access into the EMS, and from the EMS, you would have access uh, uh, into the substations. Uh, so th these are the level of controls that have build, been built uh, over uh, really about the um, last 10 years uh, in the electricity sector. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, rhetoric and, and media attention on how the grid's completely insecure. Uh, and I'm not saying it's, it's the most secure and it's uh, impenetrable in, in, in any sorts of the fashion, uh, but there has been a lot of change uh, in especially the electricity sector due to regulations uh, and other things that aren't happening in other places. And it, it's really uh, not really uh, dedicated or talked about at all. They, they just ledge it through and then get yelled at for not doing enough. But the grid itself is also very diverse. Uh, there are uh, four interconnections uh, uh, across North America. Um, there are, there's the East interconnection and the West interconnection in the United States. And then we have uh, uh, the nation of Texas who wanted to be independent as well. Uh, so they are their own interconnection. Uh, and when I mean interconnection, the transmission lines are uh, running in uh, alternating current. Uh, so uh, those three phases in sync uh, moving across the transmission lines. You can then uh, convert that to direct current, which has no phases, and then uh, move it back to uh, AC uh, so that your territory isn't in phase with the other territory, uh, and that's an interconnect. And it allows some, some break, up, break up of uh, the connections uh, where you're still sharing load between resources, but you're not quite as uh, impacted from, say, an outage in their territory into your territory. You wouldn't feel that uh, uh, reverberation, uh, uh, which is actually the, the change of, of phase from that outage, wouldn't be experienced in Texas if it happened, say, in uh, San Diego, like it happened a couple years ago. Uh, really diverse as far as, so another uh, aspect of the electric grid is that uh, it's uh, a regulatory, or it's the only uh, critical infrastructure that has mandatory regulations to it. That was uh, from the, the former company I used to work at, at NERC. Uh, so NERC actually was granted authority by Congress uh, through FERC from the uh, Federal Power Act of 2000, uh, 2005. Uh, so it, it's not government and it's not, uh, uh, and it's not uh, private sector. Uh, that doesn't mean it's best of both, it's, it's a mix. Um, uh, but they, they have regulatory oversight and, and they grant the, that oversight and the, the audit function of uh, the standards that they create uh, to these uh, different colors. They have WEC, MRO, MPTC, RFC, CERC, FERC, or FRCC, uh, SPP, and TRE. Those would be, uh, well for you guys, MPCC would be the uh, institution, um, I'm not sure how large they are, um, probably not more than 100 employees. Uh, uh, and they would be the auditors that come up and say, show me you're compliant. Uh, and, and then the asset owner would walk through uh, and show compliance. Um, that, only, that only accounts for transmission and generation of certain sizes. Uh, distribution is not in scope uh, for uh, regulatory. Uh, so the, the sorts of um, um, regulations that NERC provides is at the, the high voltage uh, level for transmission generation. Uh, but you also have a lot of complexity in um, a lot of the engineering terms that NERC comes up with. NERC is very much a electric engineer focused company, as you might imagine, uh, doing the grid, uh, which means lots of acronyms. So GEO, TO, RC all mean something to uh, NERC people. Uh, GEO being uh, grid operator, or I'm sorry, generator operator, uh, TO, transmission operator, and RC is reliability, uh, 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 reliability coordinator. What all those means, we, we know, I can probably guess what generator operator and transmission operator means. Uh, RC is something more unique um, where it is a uh, more regional aspect 
uh, that balances the load and, and the demand across a uh, region, such as a multi-state region. Uh, and so they will be they would be the one who would dispatch uh, commands, such as if it were a really hot day uh, and uh, they're, they're uh, running sh uh, low on reserves. Uh, they'll uh, issue commands to various utilities to turn off certain customers. Uh, then these are pre-planned uh, sort of scenarios where they uh, reduce where they can reduce load uh, so that they don't get too close to the margins and actually have to experience uh, brownouts, things along those lines. That's done at a very high level called the, the RCs. So where does that put us? Um, can software cause physical damage? Do we want to take a poll? <laughs> and um, why, yes, it can. I'll show you a video. Uh, so this video, so I, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, being mentored and friends with uh, uh, multiple people at INL and, and others that were in charge of testing this theory. Uh, so can, can software uh, do physical damage? Uh, this was uh, officially FOUO, and, and now it's public data because it's on Wikipedia, so I can show it here. Where'd my... It's about a minute and a half long. It may look familiar. Oh, I can unmute it. So that's a, a large Ooh. generator. Uh, a generator, by the way, makes electricity by spinning really fast or over a bunch of magnets. I had mentioned alternating current before and the generators being in sync with all the other generators uh, uh, that are on the grid. So what if a software takes the grid offline, off of the grid, and then waits till it's 180 degrees out of phase and then puts it back on? It causes torque, and if you keep doing that, uh, it causes destruction. So this was a, a test done at Idaho National Labs uh, back in 2000 to see if it could be done. This, they had a very large test test range uh, uh, where they were able to build this equipment and, and test it out. Um, regarding Aurora, there were a, a lot of um, I guess, things done to help mitigate that. And there are devices you can put in front of your generators. There are uh, uh, different uh, special equipment uh, to prevent that sort of uh, uh, action from taking place. And, and there's open debate on, well, this was done in a lab. There's, you didn't do this right, and I think it could be done this way. And, and a lot of people arguing back and forth, right? Because the lab is not real world. Can, can it happen in the real world across multiple uh, generators, something along those lines? It's never happened yet. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, some more bad news. Uh, this is a map uh, of uh, every industrial control system that is actively on the internet. So I, I, I talked about uh, all these layers and you have to dive deep down to get access to them. Yeah, uh, that is a reference model, not necessarily reality. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you can see uh, certainly I would say uh, uh, Western society is more susceptible to industrial control systems uh, uh, attacks than, and then maybe some others. Um, but there's some nuance here. So this, uh, this visualization was uh, done by uh, John Matherly who uh, owns Shodan. Uh, Shodan is a, a website, you can go there, shodan.io, uh, that uh, uh, scans the internet, not unlike Google, except uh, Google searches for web pages and does keyword searches so that you can find pictures of cats when you need it. Shodan instead uh, uh, does uh, network scanning, looking for uh, services that are listening by devices and then uh, uh, captures that and says, oh, that's Modbus, oh, that's a Siemens device. Uh, and then you can uh, go to it as a search engine and say, Siemens and everything that uh, resulted in having Siemens in there just shows up. And then you can click it and it'll, it'll uh, uh, load that, whether it's a web page or, or something else, it'll try and uh, connect to that, uh, that site. And, th and that's what uh, John used to, to create this visualization. 
there, there's uh, a, anything when you're dealing in large data sets, it, it's hard to say uh, what that data is. Um, trolling around, you'll find all kinds of things on Shodan from um, uh, traffic lights, uh, cameras, tons of cameras, uh, to uh, um, industrial routers and switches, to PLCs, uh, uh, building automation uh, controllers that are controlling like HVAC and uh, security cameras or door readers, all, all of that kind of stuff. All of that's there. Um, is there a footprint of like say critical infrastructure there? Uh, yeah, uh, but it's, it's it, but I would say the vast majority of it is uh, listening devices, uh, non-critical type stuff uh, that are on there. So this paints a really dire picture. It's um, the picture's not great, but it's not quite that bad. Oh, uh, just a heat map. So uh, the redder, the the, the more saturation uh, there. Um, um, so yeah, East Coast, yeah. Um, <laughs> in Silicon Valley, you can see it's bright red as well. What's that? Oh uh, no, no, he had some good research as well. Uh, so this is by uh, John Matherly, uh, who uh, he owns a Shodan service. Uh, 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 Dan uh, Kent Tentler uh, did some unique research as well, very similar to this. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I got time. Uh, what Dan did was um, really cool, where he used uh, virtual machines in Amazon that cost like a couple cents an hour to use. Uh, but he used hundreds of them at a time, and he scanned the internet in 10 minutes. Like, yeah, that's easy. Floop. And then he shirted them all off. He had automation do it all. Uh, and he was, he was scanning for uh, uh, a a uh, connectivity software so you would have remote access to your desktop and move your mouse around as if you were in front of it. And it's a protocol called VNC. Uh, and he scanned, again, he scanned the internet, the entire internet in like 10 minutes uh, uh, using Amazon uh, Cloud. Uh, and, and there's a idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic bug in, in VNC where um, Sometimes you, you can set a password so that not everyone can log into that box, but uh, you can still take a screenshot of the desktop even without a password. So he, he not only scanned the internet for all, every VNC server that's listening, he also took a screenshot of all of them too. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and reviewing these results, uh, he, I think he presented, uh, he presented at ShmooCon where I saw him, um, I want to say like, 2010, 2011, something like that, uh, in Black Hat. Uh, and, and you'd be surprised the number of HMIs uh, that he discovered just doing the, the VNC scan. Everything from like uh, dams to, to refineries to, to all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. So what happens when, when you um, buy a turbine uh, a multi, uh, like a multi-million dollar turbine, uh, and I mean, it's it's not all, well, it's kind of all a car. It, it, it's, it's a package. Uh, so you're buying the turbine, you're buying the turbine control system, you're, and all the equipment associated with that. That turbine is, again, uh, a very expensive piece of equipment that's supposed to last more than what you know, you, the lifespan of your laptop. Unfortunately, the software that's running on there is essentially the same kind of software that would be run on a laptop. Uh, so you, you have this weird collision of, you have this infrastructure that is really like warrantied for 10 years, expected to run for 20, 30 years. Uh, and, and now you have, um, the, the, from a vendor perspective, the predicament of, um, well, I can't support that. I can't buy those processors anymore. <laughs> Uh, um, and, and so you have supply chain issues of how can I, how can you uh, uh, kind of keep up maintaining that equipment, validating a new technology in, in, in there um, uh, when, when the, the IT technology is changing much more rapidly than, than the physical technology. Uh, so a thought experiment. Uh, if if uh, what's running at a certain facility was purchased uh, um, what were we doing? Uh, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, and uh, was deployed out there, and it was probably actually designed uh, um, uh, five or so years past that, so say 15 years old, it was designed. What did technology look like 15 years ago? What did your, what did your computer look like, and how stable was it? Uh, uh, how fast was your modem? 
uh, because it, that's the level of technology uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, could you, do you still remember how to compile Linux 2.0? <laughs> I do. Um, uh, but, the, but from an adversary standpoint, um, that, that, that's kind of the domain. So, so if, if they have access into this equipment, so if it is directly connected to the internet, like uh, Shodan uh, so showed, uh, then that's a bad day. If you're using that, that Purdue model and you have all those layers of defenses, um, then it's a bad day for the adversary. Because he, so if he did want to attack you and, and do that uh, Stuxnet sort of nation state uh, activity, he, he could probably do it. Uh, and he, he'll, um, that person will probably, I shouldn't say person, that team or, or multiple teams uh, in order to do that uh, will be doing uh, not just activity in the cyber realm, but possibly uh, uh, other sorts of intelligence collections to understand your environment and understand the weaknesses and, and figure out, oh, there's a modem that wasn't documented that's listening, that's connected to this PLC that I can then use as a, a, a vantage point and a pivot point into the rest of the infrastructure. And, and that's where you get into the, the, the crazy aspects of uh, adversaries. Um, but there, there's a couple key key things that um, maybe maybe we can't do. Uh, so denial of service, which is just um, uh, causing an outage, unplanned outage, uh, creating denial of control. So uh, in the case of the the steel mill, furnace was still running; you just couldn't do anything about it, uh, and you had to go into uh, 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 the ability to shut that down. Which fun fact, um, th there's only a, a like a paragraph briefing of what happened in that German steel mill attack. Uh, what we do know is that it, w it initiated as a spearfish attack. Uh, that spearfish attack uh, allowed the adversary to pivot into uh, the plant network and down in, uh, not sure how complex it was, we don't have those details, into the environment. And then for whatever reason, accident or, or intentional, caused that runaway condition where the furnace was out of control. Um, so that first part of the attack probably sounded really familiar to a lot of uh, security uh, majors where it's spear phishing, everything's spear phishing now, uh, and that happens in control systems uh, aspects uh, as well. Anyway, uh, denial of view. Uh, so um, uh, this would be just basically turning off the HMI, so the, uh, the, the process is running as is, uh, but you can't see into it. Um, a, a good example of that would be actually Stuxnet. So they were spinning those centrifuges around and, and doing all kinds of weird things to destroy the, the, uh, the machines, uh, the centrifuges. But at the same time, what was it telling the operator? We're all good. We're running at exactly, we're, we're running within specs. Thanks. Um, imagine yourself as an engineer who has the uh, the uh, government of Iran screaming, what are you doing? Like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, how do you troubleshoot that? The software is saying it's working. Uh, you're making sure you're doing everything possible that all the procedures and all the operators are doing exactly th exactly everything right. You're looking at the hardware to see if you, that um, one uh, board that you purchased from wherever is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing and it's not some sort of defect there. That's just the software. <laughs> Uh, that's that's a heck of a thing to, to troubleshoot. Uh, physical destruction, we saw that increase of the, the centrifuges and, and the Aurora test, which um, in the lab uh, destroyed a, a very large uh, generation uh, device, which going back to that, uh, from a grid perspective, uh, what's the implication of destroying a, a generator? Uh, well, certainly that uh, power plant's offline for, uh, I don't know, uh, minimally a year. Uh, uh, whether they, they uh, uh, fix the actual uh, 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 generator or buy a new one. Uh, certainly there's costs associated with that, probably insurance plans. Um, what happens if it's 20? 20, 20 generators, 20 turbines blow up. Um, that would be an interesting day. <laughs> uh, food for thought. Um, or you can manipulate the process uh, as Stuxnet did as far as uh, actually uh, changing the sequence of events, uh, slowing down the, the variable motor and, and, and causing destruction. Who would do that? Um, uh, so uh, Clappert, uh, who is uh, Director of National Intelligence, and basically the head of the intelligence community, uh, 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 stated 
it's not just us, it's not just China, it's not just Russia that can do this stuff that have offensive capabilities. Uh, minimally, uh, 30 nations have uh, some level of capability to do offensive missions. Um, if you think from a military perspective, from a nation state perspective, um, like uh, I guess from a warfare perspective, the, the, the focus of war is, um, uh, as Clausewitz put it, like uh, in, in a political me a ends to a mean beyond political means. Uh, you're forcing your will on, onto an adversary to get them to do what you need them to do, and then you're done with your war. Um, if you have offensive cyber operations, uh, the same idea. You're, you're trying to cause an effect. If you're trying to cause a physical effect rather than, say, a um, uh, a psychological uh, effect, um, such as uh, like um, releasing a bunch of uh, stuff that uh, the NSA does continually, or, or something along those lines. So then, um, but if you want to cause an impact on the physical side, um, well, that implies control systems. It implies the Internet of Things. It implies manipulating these sorts of devices to uh, whatever cause uh, you're trying to, to achieve. But there's good things. We're doing things. Uh, we're not just watching uh, all this destruction happen, uh, particularly from, well, from an uh, industrial control system security standpoint as it is. Much more awareness on this. Uh, in some ways, that, that's a downside with all the, the media attention that uh, is uh, very negative and, and kind of um, uh, generates, uh, paints with very broad strokes as far as uh, uh, the implications. Uh, there's also lots of training opportunities that didn't exist uh, 10 years ago. Uh, SANS has a whole track on industrial control systems. Uh, they have uh, an intro to ICS. Uh, they have active defense for ICS, which um, uh, it was actually authored by Rob Lee, my boss at, at Dragos. He's also a SANS instructor. Um, there's tons of, of uh, knowledge out there from a NERC SIP standpoint that th those are uh, I'm certainly the only uh, security regulations, mandatory regulations uh, in the US and I believe in the world. Uh, and, and they do have a, a impact on the market and, and ho on how asset owners think and operate their equipment. Uh, GridX uh, is a continental scale tabletop exercise that happens every two years. Um, so I've been, in, I've been involved in all of them up till now where uh, it is a, a simulation of a really bad day over, over two days. Uh, it has I, I want to say over 300 uh, asset owners that participated across it, across uh, in North America uh, those two years. It has uh, uh, the White House, uh, Department of Energy, DHS. Uh, last uh, last occurrence, which uh, was last year, uh, had I think all but one uh, field office from the FBI participate in, in GridX. Uh, so it's a huge behemoth thing uh, uh, that really does uh, move the sector forward in some capacity. Uh, sector doesn't move fast, so even an inch is progress. Um, and, and a lot of the voluntary efforts uh, from information sharing groups, task forces, a much more tightly policy level uh, uh, group called the Electricity Sector Coordinating Council, which is definitely a DC uh, acronym, ESCC, uh, where uh, CEOs uh, from the electricity sector meet up uh, with the White House and DOE on a quarterly basis and talk policy. So they do go through those scenarios of what if 10 generators uh, do get blown up? Uh, what what can you do for me, uh, a DOE? What can you do for me, DHS? I need a uh, right of way to move equipment this way. How can we solve that at a policy level? Those sorts of discussions do happen regularly in DC and have uh, moved the bar forward. Um, so. Key takeaways, I guess, uh, uh, we're, we're moving through more complexity, not less. We're not going to sever these connections and simplify uh, uh, these systems or, or get rid of them. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, they are what allow us to have the infrastructure that we allow. We don't have the manpower. We don't have a lot of the things that the, these tools enable us to do, the efficiencies and everything there. There's positives there. I just harped on all the, the downsides. Um, however, uh, the long lifetime of these devices benefits, benefits attackers. 
Um, hacking an ICS device is easy. Uh, uh, any kid can do it. Uh, you can buy one off eBay for a hundred or so dollars and um, unintentionally knock it over, uh, uh, let alone intentionally knock it over. Uh, however, that said, um, defending these uh, these environments are are uh, very possible and achievable uh, if you create visibility into the environments and, and actually. Uh, kind of instrument your SCADA and ICS environments the same way that they're instrumenting your industrial control system process. You, you need to create visibility into what's happening from a security perspective. Uh, and then when you do that, it's really easy to defend them because these environments are dirt simple. This isn't, this isn't your enterprise network with thousands of boxes, with thousands of different revs uh, communicating to God knows where, uh, doing what. Um, they are very very specific, uh, very baselineable, uh, and, and uh, small-scale approachable aspects where you can uh, absolutely defend these uh, if you are willing and, and have uh, the manpower to do it. Uh, hacking industrial controls, uh, uh, the processes themselves are hard, uh, but it is possible. It requires engineering talent, and it requires planning, it requires a lot of effort in order to do that. Uh, any any uh, any talk that is presented at Black Hat, for instance, that talking talking about uh, creating sustained uh, outages based on uh, some vulnerability they found in a feeder, uh, I think that's kind of hyperbole uh, and, and not actual, not actually true, or, or maybe the first step of a puzzle in order to to achieve that sort of effect. Um, and physical destruction. It's possible, it's really hard. It's been shown in the lab, uh, blowing up uh, really extremely expensive equipment. Uh, it, it was shown out in the field uh, with the state of the art in Stuxnet, which by the way, Stuxnet is over 10 years old and it's still state of the art, uh, which kind of uh, conveys just the level of effort needed in order to do something as sophisticated as that. It's, it's not um, die hard three. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what can we do about it? Uh, so asset owners uh, need good defenders and architect teams. Uh, they need, uh, uh, ICS manufacturers themselves need somebody who can uh, create good solid software code, follow uh, uh, software lifecycle standards uh, and engineer these systems correctly for today's world, not the world of 20 years ago. Um, and we don't need to show how easy it is to knock over these boxes uh, with uh, NMAP or, or with a simple proof of concept code. We need to instead focus on how do we build these systems better instead of um, uh, kind of kicking the guy while he's down. <laughs> um, and a really uh, good um, uh, uh, white paper that was released last week uh, by my friend, friends Mike Sante and, uh, and Andy Bachman IoT automation autonomy in mega cities in 25, uh, 2025 uh, is actually uh, written as if it were in 2025 uh, on mega cities and the impact to uh, the, the large scale problem that we would have with IoT and how do you, how do you handle large scale outages in IoT in a mega city that's been ground to a halt and you have just uh, uh, I think four or five scenarios. And um, if I didn't scare you, that'll certainly scare the hell out of you. Um, but it, it's very interesting and, and kind of a moves what I talked about into the industrial IoT of things. So if you're curious what IoT is, I would highly recommend you, you read that quick white paper. It's probably a 10, 15 minute read. Um, I thank uh, the faculty and, and Dartmouth for having me here. Uh, I hope this was interesting. Happy to answer your questions.